Yeah. And you get to sit with it at your dinner party and you get to have someone say, exactly. George, where did that come from? <laughs> How did you get that? Um, Mark, I think it's really special too. You were mentioning that you have an overflow of artwork that ends up perhaps in your closet, but also perhaps in your additional rental property, which I think is very cool. Yeah. So I, uh, my spouse and I, uh, run an Airbnb up on Cape Cod. And I think the, the, uh, the one fight we didn't have over it was how to decorate it. Cause we just had a, an overflow of art. Again, it's, uh, you know, I'm afflicted by a disease here. It's called collecting. And, um, it, and even today the, in my closet, like I've got, you know, rolled up pieces that I haven't had framed yet. Things that have come back from the framer that I haven't found a home for. Um, so it, it's kind of just like this ongoing, like in and out process, like what's coming in, what's going out. Uh, yeah, it's quite interesting. Um, but I actually wanted to like address something that you just said, which is like buying for value, et cetera, which is, I think, a really good point. Um, and, um, uh, you know, whenever I end up buying a work of art, like I, the first thing I always ask myself is like, is this even within my price point? Like if the answer is no, I, I kind of pass over it. Um, and the one kind of like argument I, I give to myself or I, a justification I make for a purchase is that, you know, a piece of art will always pay aesthetic dividends. It may, may it may never pay like actual financial ones, but you know, the, the longer you live with it, the longer you look at it, it, you know, you're reminded kind of time and time again that, oh, I, this is why I love it. This is why I purchased it. Um, so, you know, the financial aspect is never really something like front of mind for me. I, I mean, I work at a bank, so I think about, you know, return on investment all the time. And art is kind of this space where I, I think about investment very differently, which is, because I tend to collect emerging artists, I'm really making an investment in them and helping them continue their career more than I'm making an investment for myself personally. So the very first piece that I bought that was, you know, more than like a souvenir picked up in Europe or something was um, I bought it at a the Hunter College MFA Open Studios, which is a great place to check out here in the city. I walked in, I was the very first buyer of this artist's work. You know, there was just something on the wall. It's like, oh, I love that. Are you selling it? It was a thousand dollars. It was a, you know, big um, acrylic on canvas. And, um, you know, it was like, a, think about like a thousand dollars being transformative to an artist, like the confidence that that brought her, that, um, you know, her work would sell. I bought another piece from her later for my office. Um, and I don't really think about, oh, well, how is that going to, you know, am I going to sell that for $10,000 in two years? It's more like I see that thousand dollars at work for her in her ability to continue her practice. I think that's such an amazing point. And I feel like that really speaks to sort of the ethos and the evolution of how collecting is going as well. It's you know, I think historically there have been patrons who are able to support artists, but I think more and more young people are excited to be those patrons in different ways and sort of start on Instagram, but then end up, you know, at MFA programs, it's studios really interacting with the audiences directly, because I think in the past, the gallery plays a very, it still does play a very important role in nurturing careers, but there is a little more access to artists these days. And I think that's really cool. And I think it's going to have a really interesting effect on how we all collect and we all are patrons of arts and culture. Yeah, absolutely. I think the effect of technology on the art market today, a lot of it is we have direct access to the artist. And I find sometimes I get into these situations where I'm talking to artists and going to their studio. And I'm like, wait, does the gallery know? Like, am I doing the wrong thing? I think there's, it's a totally new situation that we're all kind of navigating now, but it's super cool that you're able to get direct access and artists will invite you to their studio over Instagram just because you posted something about their show. So I think it's really exciting. There was an artist that I I saw. He was posting 
progress shots. Like he wasn't even done with the picture yet. And I DM'd him and I said, you know, oh my God, you know, please let me know when that's available. I would love to buy that. And he said, it's not finished yet. Um, but end up going into a, he'd committed it to a gallery show. So I had to buy it from the gallery. And, you know, I'm thinking to myself, okay, 50% of that is going to the gallery instead of going directly to him. Um, you know, but that's okay. I'm, I'm paying for that gallery to nurture his, continue to nurture his career. It's a different way of thinking about it. Yeah, I think it's going to be super interesting to see what this direct access to artists and creatives means for us and how it sort of evolves with technology, because technology also makes a traditionally more opaque world a little more transparent as well. You can sort of see prices now if you'd like, you know, that wasn't necessarily a thing five years ago. Um, you can have those direct conversations. You can go to studio visits. I think it's a really cool way to connect. Um, and I'm excited about it. Now let's think if, if do you guys have any artists that are on your mind or places that you are looking to sort of visit and expand upon, um, to add to your home next? I know it's a tricky question and we didn't prep it. <laughs> there are just so many artists on my radar right now. I don't want to like um, omit anybody. It is being recorded, so watch out. I know. I know. I'm also afraid to like actually mention names. <laughs> okay, experiences. Are you thinking you'll pop into a gallery for your next art experience? Are you hoping to hit up an MFA? Are you scouring at social media? I, I, I'll take this one. Uh, yeah, one. So like recently, this this actually has very little to do with like purchasing art directly from artists, but recently I've gotten very into uh, going to historic artists' homes and studios. Like that's been very interesting. So kind of like uh, taking like day trips to uh, like, you know, something like the Edward Hopper house and seeing uh, they have a really expansive collection of his childhood drawings. So things like that. But in terms of like contemporary art that I'm looking at, um, this one artist, I think you follow him, John Brooks. Um, I'm very like curious and intrigued by his work. Like he does a lot of, um, I guess you can call it like large scale, um, uh, let's say like colored pencil slash uh, uh, like Conte crayon drawings, very colorful, a lot of portraiture. Um, so I, I also have been really appreciating in that vein, the kind of this, um, movement back towards, uh, like figurative art and away from abstraction. Not that there's anything wrong with abstraction, but you know, it was, it's quite, it's been quite trendy for a while. So just being able to appreciate like, uh, like craftsmanship and skill and, and draftsmanship even, uh, is refreshing. And actually like commissioning a portrait. I mean, it sounds, you're talking about like patrons in the Renaissance. I think it sounds so old school. Um, but that's an amazing way to get to know an artist. I mean, my husband and I um, had a, a great artist um, named Carl Grauer paint our portrait in, it was a, an oil on, on canvas. There were three, three hour sittings. So we spent nine hours with this artist over the course of three weeks in our living room. I mean, talking throughout I and mean, getting to know him really well. And it's a, you know, it's a beautiful work of art. It ended up in a museum show somewhere. Um, but it's also, you know, it's really special to us. And we got to work with Carl to be like, you know, can you please include this, um, you know, magazine on our coffee table? Cause this is, you know, relevant to gay history for us. And we want to have it in our portrait. I mean, in embedding those Easter eggs kind of in partnership with the artist was just a really, really cool experience. Um, yeah, that's making me think so much. And you were mentioning how abstraction, figurative, it all sort of changes and evolves. And I think one of the worries too, when you're buying art is thinking about, okay, am I going to like this in five years, 10 years, something like that, especially as styles change. Um, so when you're living with art and experiencing it, that are you, how do you feel your, does your taste change? Does it evolve? I know 
personally, I have some things I purchased early on that I wouldn't repurchase again today, but they're still very much part of my story and I love being with them. Um, do you have similar sentiments? Do you find your taste evolves and changes? Um, that's so funny you say that because I look back at what I was interested in and like five years ago and I, oh, like, oh no. But, you know, it is part of my story and it's about my journey as a collector and as an art world professional and kind of just learning through trial and error and learning through experiences. And I think your tastes just evolve over time with your experiences. You find that different things stand out to you as interesting um, once you learn more and more about different artists. So totally changes. I think the best example I've got of kind of how at least my taste has changed is that um, maybe in like, I, th I think this goes back to like 2012, 2013, I went to an art fair in Miami called Nada. And uh, at this art fair, I saw what, uh, like a, a little print and it was, it's very nondescript. It just had the, uh, the words by me, I'm at an art fair on it. Um, I'll, I'll spare the artist's name, uh, for the group, but I, I read it and I was like, I have to have this. So I, I purchased it from the, the booth at the, at the show and I picked it up, you know, a couple of weeks later back here in New York, framed it. I hung it on my wall and a couple of years later I was like, why the hell did I ever buy this? Like, this is so silly. Um, but now instead of like, you know, retiring it to the closet. I like keep it hung up more as like a, you know, kind of like a story to myself that like, you know, your taste is allowed to change. Like, you know, you're allowed to buy something that, you know, you're just like, oh, it doesn't vibe with me anymore. Um, you know, but it's, it's fun. You get to live with it and you get to realize day in and day out, like how, you know, your tastes change. I don't know that my, taste has changed as much as, you know, there's some artists that I have collected and their style, their practice has changed. And because I feel very invested in them personally, you know, I feel like I'm growing and learning along with them and I, I'm hearing why they're changing their practice. And so it's, it's almost like, you know, an extension of our friendship to have, you know, a piece, um, from quote unquote later in their career. 